Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast, where we dive into how emerging technologies will impact the world and your bank account. From monarchy to laissez-faire capitalism, from communism to anarchism, much has been written advocating for different political philosophies. Though it has proven much harder to test these ideas in practice, it would be much easier if it became possible to actually create new countries with new rules, economic systems, and social arrangements. Tonight, we're joined by Patry Friedman, a man who has a proposal to do just that. Patry is an American libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, and theorist of political economy. He founded the Seasteading Institute, a nonprofit that explores the creation of sovereign ocean colonies. If you enjoyed this interview, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with your friends. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. All right, I'll just quit all this other crap. All right. Patri, glad to have you on the show. Great to be here. Uh, if you could, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you actually came up with the idea of seasteading and, and kind of the, the progress you've made up to this point? Yeah, so... Well, I'm, I'm a tech guy. i um, been messing around with computers since middle school, and I got math and computer science degrees. And then after college, I thought about, I don't know, where do I want to live? And as a, as a lifelong libertarian, I thought, huh, the U.S. is, I don't know, it doesn't really fit with my values. And then, and also, it doesn't work very well. Like, why do I get so much better service at T-Mobile than the DMV or the government. I just started thinking about that. I was like, maybe you're in the wrong country. And uh, there's a couple of countries that are, you know, run like a solid company. No countries really that fit my values. And I just got curious about that. Thought about uh, the, the global governance as an industry uh, and kind of the market for citizens looking for countries and noticed that there's basically no startups. And we got this incredible advance of constitutional representative democracy, you know, in the U.S. 250 years ago. But there's no startups. There's no innovation. There's no clean slate rewrites to start testing with a small number of people opt in. Just all of these things that make an efficient industry you don't have. And then, of course, how to fix it. You, you kind of came to this revelation when you were still working at Google. Is that correct? It was actually um, in grad school, okay. in between college and Google. Um, yeah, and then how to fix it? Well, find a way to make startup countries. Simple to say, hard to do. Yeah. So, so you have um, a family tree with uh, some famous people in it. Uh, did that influence how you kind of think about your life? Yeah, I thought about this a bit. I think. I think there's really two things that... Uh, well, first explain who your, your oh, grandfather sure. was. Yeah, so my grandfather is Milton Friedman, a Nobel Prize winning economist and great enthusiast for libertarian ideas. My father, David Friedman, uh, is a professor of law and economics who's come up with a, a, a new political system or co-created that a lot of people are interested in called, called anarcho-capitalism. Bad name, good idea. Um, as well as uh, starting the Penzik Festival, which is 12,000 people every year for almost 50 years now, uh, using medieval technology and, and only medieval technology for a couple of weeks of camping. And my great uncle Aaron was also a, a founder of Law and Economics. And I really think there's two things. First, it gave me the, the belief that unfortunately a few people have that like that one person can do things that sound insane that can do huge, impactful things. And it gave me the chip on my shoulder to want to be a person who did really big things. So I saw the possibility, and I wanted to. And I think I would never have started on this journey otherwise. 
Ah, well, very good. I think you and I actually met one time at a World Future Society event. Uh, I believe that was in San Francisco quite a few years ago. That was a whole different era. Um, so how much how, how much impact did kind of the financial uh, crash in 2008 have on your thinking at that time? Well, it was when I was just kind of launching the Seasetting Institute, having gotten funding in 2007, I'd say the main impact. So while I'm a libertarian, my family tends to not be as much on the Ayn Rand objectivist side, but I read Atlas Shrugged in 2008 uh, during the financial crisis. And I thought, wow, I I'm even more worried than I was before about the fate <laughs> of the globe and how our <laughs> systems are working and how fast they're falling apart. So it gave me more enthusiasm to kind of work. I mean, part of what I, Part of how I think of my work is just upgrading governance and institutions in the whole world to 21st century. Like it doesn't have to be a crazy new idea that I have for how things should work. Just like modernize things, have APIs and encapsulation and test beds and just think of them in the internet way. Yeah. So, so you um, have, have kind of conducted a series of experiments along the way Um uh, through through the C-Setting Institutes. Can you step us through some of the activities and what's worked and what hasn't? It's been a slow road. I think it's, it's natural that it, it can happen when you take on something really big. So some of the things that have gone really well are anything involving fiction. So people writing novels about C-Setting, doing architectural renderings, kind of everything in that area. And I think going along with that is community building. It's been incredible. There's been a huge community that builds that gather at the ephemeral festival I've started and just try to pitch in. So that's been great. And you know, this one may not be a surprise. Turns out to be really hard is building things in the water cost effectively and medium hard working with governments. And so we did a lot of research, tried to show you know, what the actual international law is. I mean, one myth people sometimes have is that you just go on the high seas and do everything or the myth that we think that, and it's not at all true. The legal regime on the ocean is much better, uh, but it's not, it's not nothing. So trying to understand that, understand the engineering and the costs and gather this community. And the first thing we built was actually in, in 2019, this came out of the community a group called Ocean Builders. And they actually, manufactured a single spar seastead, similar design I'd made at the very beginning. That's one pillar with a platform above the water and buoyancy down below. And unfortunately they did this in, in Thailand where one of the, the couple lived. And the maritime department said, great, yeah, go to rear platform. But then the, the Thai Navy heard that these people had talked about being seasteaders and wanting to like live free on the ocean and sometimes make sovereign societies. And they didn't care that this was just a little engineering test. So they um, charged them with treason and the couple Chad and Nadia went into hiding and the Navy sent three boats and a couple hundred people to in operation destroy seastead <laughs> to bring it back to shore. And Chad oh, and Nadia made a, you know, a daring escape by boat, harrowing journey, because the nearest countries wouldn't let them in because they supported Thailand. And then they relocated to Panama where the government was happy to have them. And they've been working on this design ever since. Uh, in fact, we're gonna see the first ones roll off the production line this year. And these are so-called single family seasteads, so for a small group of people. So are, are you on some active list with governments that they're, you're on a watch list, that your activities are always under suspicion? Not at all. In fact, one of the changes the past few years has been uh, working with a lot of governments. So Seastead Institute was working with French Polynesia for a bit, um, and the issues were kind of more with, uh, with getting enough funding for the company and now with the government. But there's been this really big change in the, in the past few years. I wonder if you agree with this. I have this perspective that the 21st century started in 2020, that the first two decades were the old century kind of hanging on and hanging on. And in 2020, the pandemic's like, nope. 
Yeah, the the pandemic is definitely a big demarcation point. Uh, so there's the the pre COVID era and the post COVID era. Um, so uh, how how radically did that disrupt your activities and your plans? It it, it was a huge tailwind for us. Uh, so so to back up a little, so one of the big changes with governments in the past two years is as we're kind of adding another path. There's the seasteading path and then the charter cities path. And charter cities are sort of an extension of the special economic zone to deeper reforms. It's a region in a country designated by the government to have different laws and institutions. So it's a way to have sort of a, a, a test bed um, that is under supervision of a country. Um, the main level we go for is follow the country's constitution and criminal law and write, bring in uh, the city's own commercial law, which is approved by the government regulator. And so these are, you know, it's less ambitious than seasteading, but the flip side is it's, it's kind of easier to do now. And we've been getting kind of more and more governments interested in this. So in fact, in my charter city investment company, our shortage is founders. It's not capital, it's not governments, it's, it's great teams to run these. So that's been a big change. And I think it's partly because countries are getting with the 21st century. Small countries realize that they're nimble, they can do new things, and that's how they you know, benefit themselves. Cryptocurrency is showing there's new ways of doing things. And then the pandemic kind of brought that to another level. It showed that it's a new world, it's a new century, and the old ways really aren't working. So uh, explain a little bit about your, your funding that you've received so far and how are you funded moving forward? Yeah, so there's, there's two main vehicles. There's the Seasteading Institute, which is a nonprofit, and there's Pronomos Capital, which is an investment fund. Seasteading Institute, so I started working on these ideas in about 2001, giving a few talks. I wrote, I wrote a free online book where I wrote software so you could click on every paragraph and leave comments. This is before that would get spammed. So that was a lot of fun. I wrote a whole book on seasteading. A lot of it was about the technology, everything you needed. Uh, and then in 2007, uh, I was put in touch with Peter Thiel and he agreed to fund this nonprofit. So I left Google, started the nonprofit. Peter was the, the main funder for, for several years and we've shifted over time to a variety of other of other private donors. And we were like, the Seas thing too was also helped by crypto too, because uh, we started taking donations in Bitcoin quite early and just kind of ignored them because, you know, <laughs> who knows how to even sell. And then over time that ended up being two or three years of, of budget. I mean, we operate pretty cheaply, uh, 200,000 a year. So that was wonderful and that, and that helped things. And then Pronomus Capital, uh, this, this sector of kind of competitive government, startup countries, new ways of organizing, finally got to the point in about 2017, 2018, where it looked like I could start investing in it full time um, across other projects, not just my own project. And so our main investor, again, is, is Peter Thiel, a, um, you know, kind of a, a godfather to parts of the Silicon Valley uh, futurist put into practice movement and someone who I admire a lot. And our other investors are, I would say, are mainly crypto people and some of the top people in the kind of that side of, of tech uh, are our advisors and investors, people like Balaji Srinivasan and Naval Ravikant and Joe Lanzi and a lot of, a lot of great people. Yeah, I was, I was wondering, there seems to be a lot of parallels between the crypto community and what you're doing with the seasteading world um, in that uh, uh, the idea of a, a, a DAO, a, a decentralized autonomous organization, and having um, kind of new forms of government that kind of are autonomous in the way they're set up. Uh, and also the the funding mechanisms that are available in some of the new uh, crypto thinking uh, among some of the startups, I think uh, uh, would apply to you in some interesting ways. Now, has the the recent crash has that uh, affected how you're doing things? Or I mean, we're still kind of wrestling with is this a long term crash or a short term crash? It 
the crash hasn't affected that much, but then again, I'm uh, you know not not yet raising the next fund, so we'll see where it happens then. You know, we've we've kind of got our capital to deploy for a few more years, um, and yeah, like you said, the the parallels are enormous. And maybe this is arrogant, but part of how I look at it is, you know, crypto people were so aligned, and most of our investors are crypto people because these are people who believe in creating private decentralized alternatives to something the state has mainly done, money and finance, and in many cases have, have profited hugely from that. And what I've been trying to do for 20 years is create private decentralized alternatives to everything that the state does. <laughs> so it's sort of the same concept, but bigger. So of course they made progress sooner, but that's part of why it's so like-minded. It's, it's, as I said at the beginning, it's upgrading our institutions to the 21st century. We're just both doing that. Yeah, interesting. Um, I've been playing around with this idea of, of um, oh, everything from micro nations to virtual countries for quite a few years. And, uh, and you, can't, um, you can't really create something that is, unless it's recognized by other countries. And that, that area of recognition is, is kind of an interesting barrier to overcome because existing countries don't like other people playing in their sandbox, so to speak. Um, so I, I played around with this idea of, of actually having, um, we, we don't have the central authorities for lots of uh, global systems that are being created right now. And if, as an example, you were to create a global system for privacy, um, you know, if, if every country has to come up with their own privacy policies and we have 180, 200 some privacy policies around the world, so it becomes such a blur that effectively there's no good privacy policy. But if you had a, a central privacy authority where individual countries then were members of it and that it would be best hosted in a, a neutral ground, which could be a, a seasteading mm. city-state or nation-state, then um, they then would be members of this. They would then be funding it individual nation states would be funding it. And uh, each, a couple, two or three times a year, then they'd send their representatives, uh, two, two of their best privacy experts to come and sit on this council and d determine privacy policy for the world, so to speak, for the, uh, for the next period of time. Um, that, that seems like an interesting um, kind of way to get recognized at the same time that you're creating funding and at the same time mm -hmm. giving kind of a mission to this this new nation state that's being created. Um, uh, so I, I don't know, have you played around with other concepts similar to that? Yeah, first, I'm not at all surprised that you've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. Uh, and this kind of set, you know, area that you're in is definitely something that, that I've been to. And I guess the first thing I'd say is there's a lot about what you're suggesting that fits into this just organizing for the 21st century, right? I really envision things as, as kind of like breaking down centralized hierarchies where a lot of power is at the top, but then it doesn't mean that there's no large organizations, right? It's just more like individuals collecting together into groups by choice and groups collecting together and you're having a hierarchy of collaborative levels and what you're suggesting fits exactly into that. The main difference I think is, well, let's, let's keep in mind the reality, but the great thing about standards is that there are so many of them to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. I think that the modern, the, the one piece you're missing is that the modern way is kind of for, for more fluid, opting in to various standards and the organization, not really, you know, not having the right to set them all, but that there's a group of people who are really, really good at this and maybe have some support of some countries and they, they create these kinds of standards, um, you know, probably, you know, not for profit uh, and open source and then countries that, or, or jurisdictions more generally, because I think we're going to see a fractioning of countries uh, that want to use it will use it and there'll be kind of competing ones and, and market forces. And, you know, just like with tech, right? If there's a country that, oh, I really want this upgrade or improvement, 
to the privacy system because I want it for myself. I'll fund if it sounds good to the organization, I'll, I'll, I'll fund it. And so just kind of be more fluid. And, you know, part of my thing is I want to, my two governing metaphors are countries as businesses and law as software. So my insights from 10 years at Google, I don't want to say insights, just basic software knowledge. And so I want to see like, not just a standard, but open source, modular, forkable laws, like just bring this, you know, incredible power that we have for organizing information to laws. So this org would create these standards and here's the default build, right? But maybe we have some alternative modules because it's well modularized. So you can be like, oh, I want this particular section on use of biometric data to be different from my country or aggregate statistics on health. And so it's open source. The country picks, you know, a set of it, customizes it how they want, makes new customizations and contributes back to the open source repository. So that's my vision. And it would totally fit with doing collaborative countries like you suggest. Yeah, it just seemed like um, having a having a mechanism to get the recognition at the same time that you get participation from yeah. other countries. That that seems like it's a fascinating mechanism, uh, and, yeah. and and we are in the process of creating many more global systems right now. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to speak for the Turkish Post. Um, and they, they brought me in and they wanted to have me speak on the future of the postal industry. And uh, uh, so they brought in, they actually had representatives from 99 countries, um, the postal industries in 99 different countries. And they were talking about best practices. And, uh, and so I started off my talk asking this central question of how long would it be before we mail a package in, let's say, Istanbul, and it arrives in San Francisco without ever touching any human hands. Mm. And uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, in the in the digital world, we, we put something into the digital world and it gets routed around and comes out over here. How long before we can actually put a package into the system, it gets routed around and comes out over here. Uh, and then I went into analyzing all of the different uh, systems. Some of them are very advanced that are sorting packages and uh, sorting letters and things like that. But then there's always this gap where you have to physically haul these uh, tubs of things to this ship or to this truck or something. And all of that will eventually get automated, but nobody has that global vision of creating a system for that. And so the postal system is just another one of those systems. I mean, there's uh, privacy systems, there's global accounting systems, there's global patent systems there. You can kind of go down the list and uh, come up with a number of these authorities that will, I think, eventually get created uh, through some G20 summit or something like that. Um, but anyway, that's uh, going down that path. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and it's, it seems like that type of mechanism uh, might be helpful for you. Have you, have you uh, can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would put what you said squarely into um, upgrading our institutions physical and virtual and legal and other for the 21st century. And, you know, we're kind of working our own part of that related to, to governance, but it's a whole, it's a broad movement that needs to happen at massive scale. There's going to be tons to be done, done with it. Uh, I think it'll be a bit like software eating the world. In fact, you could even position it as a, a facet of software eating the world that will affect every country and every industry. And specifically part of what I see is that Look, the world of atoms is different from the world of bits. Like right. things have to be physically moved. However, I think that we've very much underused insights and techniques from the world of bits on the world of atoms. And what you gave is just a perfect example of that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to use kind of more automation. And I, I would view what you're saying is similar to the revolution of the shipping container. Um, you know, before that, everything was hand carried onto boats and stuck in right. corners <laughs> you know, by these longshoremen. And you're kind of doing a, another step where you won't just have the shipping container, you'll have smaller units and smaller units, and they'll all be put on in an automated way. It seems not that far off. What is farther off and we really want, of course, is pneumatic 
to transport on a global scale, and then it can not only not be touched by a human, <laughs> but actually come quite quickly. Right, right. Um, so what do you view as your next step? What's, what's your next big project that you're working on? The, so on the seasteading side, the main focus is on manufacturing um, these single family seasteads and kind of transitioning the community from you know, talking and thinking to actually living in some of these um, in, in Panama and kind of getting out there on the water. They're not very expensive. I think the base ones are, I don't know, maybe 150,000, something like that. Of course, on the water maintenance is, is, is much higher. Your, your OPEX is a fraction of your CAPEX, but you know, that's okay. And then on the city side, it's, you know, actually working with governments to draft and pass legislation and finding founding teams to help start these, these charter cities and doing whatever we can as investors to help them succeed. So are you actively following all the charter city activity around the world? Yes, very much so. And I'm, I'm involved in, in a good, good chunk of it. Yeah, I was, I was asked to uh, participate in the NEOM project in Saudi Arabia, which has turned into this project called The Line. Um, and it's evolved in a rather interesting way. Uh, the rumor had it that there was uh, 10,000 McKinsey consultants in the background working. 13, 13 teams, I don't know how many consultants, 13 teams of which one of the 13 has the job of managing the other 12. That's what I heard. <laughs> yeah. And my bias is that a project like that is in a lot, a lot of danger. But, you know, what do I know? It's, just, it's, not, it's not my scale and level of centralization, but I wish them the best of luck. It's fascinating. And I know yeah. they're going to throw off a lot of tech for everyone else, whatever happens with their project, which is a huge gift to the world. Yeah, uh, a lot of brain power going into that one there. Uh, so are you, are, are you sufficiently funded for what you're trying to do? I mean, are you looking for more capital, capital all the time? Um, yeah, I think we're sufficiently funded to get things started and, you know, we're, we're transitioning to getting enough capital to do first builds. Uh, so, you know, we do small seed checks that help a company when they're not buying land yet right? They're not building. They have an idea. They're seeing if there's a market for the industries that would go in that city. They're working with the government on regulations, building up their potential tenants, kind of all these things that don't cost a huge amount of money. And then we're able to participate in a small way in like a small first build and not at all after that. So we're very much interested in kind of moving up, you know, moving to later stage investments. Um, you know, and, and having enough capital that we can fund some of those build and second build stages. What we're doing for now is building a network of, of co-investors, um, you know, in, including in the Middle East. I was just in Dubai last month for the first time, and I'll be there again this summer. And being able to help companies in the space raise from those co-investors uh, as we kind of transition towards also being one of those later stage investors. So it occurs to me that there's only certain parts of the world that are effective uh, places for seasteading, that you put something in the middle of the Pacific that that's a little too turbulent and violent that things would, would get torn apart. Um, you, you mentioned Panama as a, a good first starting point. Can you talk a little bit about where the kind of the safe water zones are around the world? Yes, we think about that a lot. And just, you know, it, for you, here's a really fun thing. You mentioned the middle of the ocean. Uh, I don't know if you know about that. There's a simple mathematical proof that the optimal point to arbitrage between two markets is with equal ping time to each of them. <laughs> and so halfway okay. in between London and New York, because if you're halfway in between, in between the total signals only have to travel one X distance. Okay. If you're here, it has to go double the distance if you're in one of those centers. So there will be seasteads of some type, maybe underwater, that are on those midpoints just to win at arbitrage. It's just, it's fun. Like, you know, like you, I'm a first principles thinker and seeing something that like you never thought of, it has a simple mathematical proof uh, is wonderful. But what we look at for location, here's the thing, the hardest thing on the ocean, I say two things, waves 
and being far away from people, right? right. And yeah. so for waves, it's essentially there's the equatorial doldrums, which have much shallower waves close to the equator. So that's a, that's a prime area. And then, oh, and anchoring. So anchoring is just prohibitively expensive in, in depth. And so finding, you know, so islands are sea mounts or underwater mountains that rise above the water. But if it doesn't quite rise above the water, it's called a sea mount. And so sea mounts that give you, you know, 50, 100, 200 meters anchoring depth, or even the possibility to build pillars on them, but are not within 200 nautical miles of any rock above the water at mean high tide, because any rock will extend the country that claims it, um, their resource rights out 200 nautical miles. And so everything above water at high tide is claimed, except for Antarctica, which is kind of claimed by, by treaty. And so just finding those anchoring places um, that are in what's called the high seas outside of the exclusive economic zone, and then uh, either in the equatorial doldrums um, or, I mean, you can think of it as just the taller your spar, the higher waves you can avoid. And it's just a, a cost factor. The smaller the waves you're in, the, the cheaper and the higher, the more expensive. Uh, and then the lap, like the, the, the distance, right? Ideally, you want to find these that are, um, you know, close to a bunch of economic centers and people as much as you can being 200 plus miles out. And that's very difficult. And that's why I think with seasteading, we're also very much uh, wanting to work with governments because if you work with a government, you can be, you know, for sure in the 12 to 200 nautical mile zone. And if the government passes a law, um, you know, maybe the Panama area could become a special economic zone or, or, or more or a charter city over time, then you can do it anywhere. Um, and have your own legal jurisdiction. And so I think that's the path forward for a while until it's got to be really big to be able to be far away and still draw people. So are any of the cruise lines uh, kind of anxiously watching what you're doing? Are they uh, interested in participating in any way? No, I wish they would be. <laughs> but who is interested is the, the flagging states. So some of the, the, the main flagging registries are like, huh, and a flagging registry is, so that's really interesting. So the way that maritime law works is because ships move all over the place. There's a virtual association between a ship and a country. The ship registers there, the country regulates them. And when you're inside 12 nautical miles, you're just governed by the country uh, whose, whose waters you're in. 12 to 200, you're governed by the flag except for resources, except for fishing and wind power and any of those things. Uh, oil and minister, minerals, obviously the reason it exists. Uh, and when you're governed by the, the flagging state, it's almost like you're a, a virtual, like an embassy moving around in their territory. It's actually, it's more complicated than that. If something happens on a cruise ship, like if someone attacks someone else, the flagging country, the countries of each of the two people and the kind of closest country a country who's easier in they all get pieces of the dispute so it's it's tremendously complicated um but so these flag registries who have a business of you know taking registration and and uh doing what little oversight is needed so they're interested i wish the cruise lines would be there is this one cruise ship the world uh which is a condo cruise ship that just travels the world continuously but it was a it was a large financial failure. I mean, they launched before the 2008 crash, um, and eventually the residents bought it back from the bank at, at a large loss, and it's still operating. But I really think that there could there's a lot more that could be done with with cruise ships traveling small loops, just like the main cruise lines do, so that your logistics is much simpler and you can get the costs down. There are people looking at retirement cruises. I've worked a bit on medical tourism cruises. I think it's a great idea. I think seasteading is really underused cruise ships. Um, we did try, so these, the Panama guys uh, bought uh, a cruise ship. I mean, the, uh, the, the Satoshi, uh, but it, it failed inspection for classification. Um, but they, but look from first principles, right? A cruise ship is the package of infrastructure that you can move to any place with a port, right? If you want to right. deploy 
electricity and water and housing and everything to a place, that's the way. And they're all selling for scrap value now, the old ones, because they've been overbuilt. I think there's a lot to be done by thinking about it that way. Yeah, it would seem like um, cruise ships could build their own their own island, their own port, their um, their unique place that they could take their ships to that nobody else can, um, and that would be a, a a good marketing ploy on their part. Um, I you know I'd be fascinated to go to this um, this little city nation state out in the ocean and see ocean agriculture and um, uh, kind of other water sports and other entertainment that can happen there that you can't quite do on the ship itself. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I think there's there's huge opportunity if they kind of brainstorm that. Uh, but is, uh, does, um, I, don't, I don't know how this works, is the deterioration of a vessel, is it less underwater than it is above water? More. Oh, it is more. More, okay. the, the, the corrosion. Okay. From the salt water. Yeah, because if you build tunnels under the earth, then they tend to deteriorate at a far slower rate than something that's exposed to the atmosphere. Because the earth, the earth is not caustic. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So if you were able to build it under one of these platform islands out there, then it would be different. Okay. Uh, interesting. I... I think that this is such a fascinating area that uh, I don't know if I I've been been on quite a few cruise ships and I I, I enjoy um, kind of the adventurous nature of that so I I I think that that tie-in should should be a logical fit sometime in the future but uh, you're in our target market yeah <laughs> yeah um, so interesting so. What, uh, what, now you have an annual event um, that you put together, is that correct? Yeah, the, the Ephemeral Festival. And I was inspired by my dad's medieval festival that I grew up going to every summer and by Burning Man. Uh, the, the, I guess we ended up like Burning Man in that it's a festival, not really any hope the way it's being done now of going into something sustainable, which, which is fine. Festivals are great. But partly I looked at Burning Man and I thought, wow, all of this pioneering energy to build all of this infrastructure. And then a bunch of it just gets like destroyed every year. It's not really building up except for people's kind of camp setups a little bit into something that could be more permanent, doesn't have an economy. And I was thinking, okay, it's really, really hard to start a new country, (laughs) you know? Um, but maybe we could get a bunch of people to go out to in, into international waters for a week, a year, and actually live under some new legal system. Like that's the art. And we have a bit of that with ephemeral in that every island has its own rules. So there's islands where you have to wear clothes and islands where you don't. There's islands where no media is allowed. And there's a very small number of islands where media is allowed. And you can detach from an island if you don't like the rules and go to another island. I actually did this one year. And so it's playing with these concepts of dynamic geography, the idea that things on the ocean or in space can be rearranged physically very cheaply in a way that's completely different from land. Like the the fundament of the ocean is different and the fundament of the firmament is different, right? On the ocean, you just need like a, a motor to move something, a big building around. In space, you could you get out and push if you're willing to move it very, very slowly. Right. So I think there's all kinds of implications to this movement from fixed on land to oceans and space where things are just going to be more rearrangeable and then philosophically and legally maybe too. Yeah. So so where does this event take place at and how many people attend and how much does it cost to go to that? So it's in the Sacramento Delta region, which is near the California Bay Area. And there's no cost because after the first year, uh, it just became community organized. The first year was done by the Seasteading Institute. No cost to the event. Now, getting a platform or a vessel of some type out to the spot, you know, can, can cost a fair bit. I think the first year was maybe 100, 150 people. I think it's gotten as far as 500, um, maybe a bit more. It's been going since 2009 every year. 
and you just have to you have to get something that floats and that you can live on to the spot. Um, and when so do, when does it take place? This year it'll be the last week in July. It's generally sometime in the summer. Okay. It's my, during my birthday this year, so I'm really excited to go spend spend the week there and have it be you know kind of enjoy my birthday with so many of my old friends. So explain how people can become part of the Sea Setting Institute or um, get updates on the progress and that sort of thing. Yeah, so you should you know, follow our social media, which is uh, at Sea Setting on Twitter. You can look at the website, seasetting.org, to find uh, other ways to keep in touch. And it's big enough now that it's not just the nonprofit. So look into Ocean Builders. There's a whole group down in Panama who are working on different kinds of ocean technology that all relates. Um, and we, we haven't, other than ephemeral, we haven't done many events for a while, you know, with, with COVID and, and also right, you know, right. events are tough, but the eph ephemeral kind of ends up being the main gathering. And, and I think that there'll be at least one event in Panama this year. So, those are the main places. Now, do you have you you have competitors? I mean, there's other people trying this, or there are other organizations that are. <laughs> oh, I oh. wish, I wish we're so we're so crazy. Uh, yeah. There's, I mean, there's people like uh, like those those crazy crazy floating platform people in Japan, Shimizu, who okay. just you know they they're a large engineering firm who who have kind of our sense of of whimsy. And they sort of like to design and work on seastead-like things. Um, there's a you know growing number of, of engineering firms that are working on things like this. I'm an investor in a company called Flexbase International in Singapore that's working on very large floating structures um, for kind of expanding cities that are space constrained, constrained to near shore. Uh, I'd say on the on the broader competitive governance and charter city side, there's more organizations. So there's the Startup Societies Foundation, the Free Private Cities Institute, the Charter Cities Institute. Um, you know, kind of this whole wave of of expansion with other people who got excited about this idea after the Seasteading Institute. I think that's been a huge success of Seasteading. It's been hard to build things, but the number of people interested in wait, why don't we start new countries? How do we start new countries? Um, why don't we get to try out new sets of laws is huge. And that's just starting to really buoy the whole movement. Yeah, I saw a video where Peter Thiel was asking the, the fundamental question of, is the world going to be better off with relatively more countries or relatively fewer countries? And I, I happen to fall in the camp of, I think we'd be better off with relatively more countries because the, it gives us the opportunity to experiment and try new things. Everything else is too locked in our old old way of doing things. Um, so let, let, let's take, for example, that you create this, um, this new city-state in the ocean. Um, can you explain a little bit about what, have you calculated out what the optimal start size should be of it, uh, how many critical pieces you need and critical elements, what the economy is going to be based on, um, and uh, uh, kind of uh, some of the fundamental things that would be necessary to think through a startup like this. Yeah, so it's it's less of an optimal start size and more like the bigger the better, except we don't have the funding and can't practically do a crazy new thing at large scale. You know, we're not we're not Neom, and right. it's more about how can we figure out how to make it practical at the smallest scale possible. And that's why single family seasteads are kind of the natural step right now. And I think small cruise ships, uh, because the single family seastead, it's, it's think about it like an RV. It's a package of infrastructure that is not too expensive and is mobile. And like, you know, the difference between an RV and a car is that the RV is optimized for living space and infrastructure, not for efficiency of movement. And on the ocean, because we don't have the, has to fit into this particular sized road constraint, the difference between something optimized for moving, like a sailboat or a container ship, 
and optimize for stability and comfort and cost-effective space is a lot larger. They, they look more different. Um, and so I think these are starting to show how there's, you know, it's more like oil rigs, but small and mass manufactured and cost-effective. Um, so optimize for sitting and being there. So I think that's a really important way of cutting it down. I think that if someone gets the right business for a cruise ship, that's another way to make it easier. You know, one of my, I get all, asked all these questions about how would you do this or that bit of infrastructure? And I say, if it's done on a cruise ship, don't even ask me, right? We have our proof of concept. You know, cruise ships are cost effectively, they all the water and the sewage and the electric, it's, that's all done. And, you know, what's interesting is what are the other things you need? Anchoring systems, uh, breakwaters. I mean, I have this idea, you'll like this. Again, first principles and scaling laws. So the area, let's say a circular breakwater protects, goes up by the square of the radius and the, so the material in the breakwater goes up linearly with the radius. So you get a one over R economy of scale as you grow it. And because waves are one of the, you know, top three difficult things, um, you know, waves, anchoring, and getting people out there, it's a way to potentially very cost effectively create a large calm region anywhere that you can anchor. So I'm really excited to see that someday as well. But yeah, it's just now on the business side, that's absolutely critical. Uh, I think that medical tourism is a big one. Aquaculture, you know, there's this idea that uh, aquaculture is to kind of the way we fish today as like agriculture is to gathering, um, you know, or ranching is to hunting. It might be massively more efficient and scale up enormously. That has a lot of potential. Um, and then the things that outlet an efficient jurisdiction can do better, uh, you know, taxes where you get what you pay for. So uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the other infrastructure. I mean, you, you need water harvesters to, to, to get fresh water. Um, you need solar or wind systems to generate power. Um, what other elements do you need then? It's the, it's the same thing as any city. And the question is what's difficult and what's easier, right? So I don't know, like water, it turns out that you have access to all the salt water, but that's not really any easier, maybe yeah. harder than getting it on land. Um, you have these new challenges like anchoring and waves. Um, you have these things that are easier, like anything that, that uh, can just hang out underwater, like giant cages of fish or algae farms, or whatever, you just have infinite space for free. I think internet, you know, especially when I was looking at this pre-Starlink, um, you know, as Starlink rolls out, that, that won't be a problem. You know, pre-Starlink, you know, there's the idea of dropping a tendril, a fiber tendril to one of the lines. I think that's, it's fun, but extremely expensive. Right. You can do point to point uh, to shore with a series of, of towers. And of course, it, you know, the, the higher tower is, the, the longer the, the line of sight. And so a seastead can be optimized if you can deal with the, the stability for being just really small and really narrow and very tall, uh, and then having the buoyancy go way down and various things to make it as, as stable as possible, especially if it can be anchored, it can be pretty stable. Hopefully we only have to do uh, satellite transport. I mean, if you have a breakwater, you have a free airstrip, like that part's easy. If you don't have a breakwater, you can't land anything but, but helicopters, um, you know, unless you've got a large set of platforms, fast ferries, uh, you know, hydrofoils, yeah. whatever the latest tech is. It, it strikes me that um, there's there's quite a bit of competition right now. Trying countries trying to be the first that builds a space based power plant that beams the power down to Earth, and the uh, the receiver for that power, which is a giant microwave coming down, is uh, intended to be an island. Uh, that would be the center point for all that. Um, is, is that a, a possible starting point for a seasteading community surrounding that? Once those things are real, absolutely. I mean, space spaceport fits in, in so many ways. You want it to be out in the ocean. You benefit from the distance because of safety concerns. Um, 
it's very like-minded people. So I think it's a natural fit, but it's just, you know, right now we're looking for, you know, kind of industries we can do now. Um, right. yeah, you will see Seastead Space, but I mean, look at, look at what, um, the sea launch, even before, uh, even before SpaceX started doing this, the sea launch, there was a company that just had a platform in I think LA or San Diego, and they would drag it out and launch a rocket and bring it back. So we've been seeing, you know, oh. platform based launches for quite a while. Two decades, I think. Ah, oh, very interesting. So um, you're you're kind of right on the edge of the right timing, but not quite there yet. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And SpaceX just built their own. But I think having one steadily deployed as the number of launches increases. Yeah. Um, now, are there are there manufacturers that are uh, actively designing, working on? Uh, kind of a personal C setting home unit uh, that could be tied to a community like this. So I, I lost a little bit of you there. Um, you, uh, are, are, is there anybody actively manufacturing um, a home base unit that, if I wanted to buy a unit mm -hmm. that I could eventually bring to uh, the C setting community? Are there companies in Japan or Korea, the United States, or are they building these already? So the only company building it is our friends, Ocean Builders in Panama. And they've built, oh, they've built the prototype and they're going to start rolling off the production line later this year. So you can get one of these C pods to start. And, and you said the price is around 150000 I think I think that's it for the for the base unit. And okay, it, you know, it goes a bit more as you add options. Right, but still, it's minuscule compared to a house in California. Okay, and then the um, you can avoid the land costs naturally, but the the maintenance and upkeep uh, will be a little bit higher then. Yeah, so the the that world, the cruise ship, the condo cruise ship, I think. It's it's high end luxury, right? And like the smallest condo initially was I think was one point five million and then two hundred and fifty thousand a year in operational costs. So like one sixth, which is extremely high compared to a house. Now I, I think a big part of that is because they're traveling constantly, burning diesel and the logistics. I think they had a team of twenty people to handle resupply when you don't come back to the same port for at least two years. So I that's why I look more to to cruise ships at what their operational expenses are, which is still higher than a home, but but quite a bit lower than one sixth. Uh, yeah, it would seem like um, if you have the right offering, it's gonna grow rather quickly. So one of the techniques we use in the futuring world is a, a technique called backcasting. And we, we set our sights on a preferable f future, uh, something that we would love to aim towards and then we work backwards from there uh, so if you were to uh, do back casting for seasteading and you started 10 years out uh, 2032 2033 and work backwards what do you see this looking like uh, 10 years in the future i think you have multiple communities of sea pods living near shore and a couple out on a seamount using custom flags from flagging organizations that, that delineate kind of what their autonomy is and isn't. I think you start to have cruise, cruise ships move. Cruise ships already do some amount of using the, the legal freedoms. So there's all these cosmetic surgeries on cruise ships. Um, you know, the, the labor laws and tax laws are different. But you see cruise ships more and more realize that it's not just about this, you know, moving package of infrastructure, but about the legal environment and kind of doing more and more things with that. These large engineering companies, you know, not most of them, you know, but the really innovative ones like Shimizu getting interested in this. And I think, I think if you get the combination of interest from those companies and really compelling business uses like a spaceport, I think you'll see uh, at least one, maybe more like a large scale 
platform communities built and growing. But if there isn't that compelling business need that makes up for the extra costs, then it's it's not practical to have more than these like smaller single family homes. Probably a lot of innovation on how they cluster together, how they interconnect in ways that work with the waves, how you have your multi-point anchoring, which is actually quite difficult. I don't think I don't think anybody's done multi-point deep sea anchoring for something like a collection of 50 C pods. Like nobody's done it. So we get to figure that out. <laughs> um now it, it strikes me that there's there's lots of people out there that would be falling in love with this idea if they knew more about it and they somehow engaged with you. Um, how how do people get involved in in um, um, in a, a bigger way, so to speak? How do how do they really dive in and uh, and become part of the seasteading community? So there's a lot of information on the Seasetting Institute website, seasetting.org, and on Ocean Builders. I think it's ocean-builders.com. And social media keeps people updated with what's happening in the sector. Um, there are some volunteer opportunities available if you contact the Seasetting Institute. But I think the best way is to kind of join this, you know, broad growing community around the world and look for, there's just more and more projects that aren't run by the Seasteading Institute, like the, the cluster of people working on different ocean projects and technologies in, in Panama, kind of loosely surrounding ocean builders, and become part of the community, talk to people about what's exciting, about what they think is realistic, and kind of find one of those projects. I mean, buy a sea pod. That's, a, <laughs> you know, if you've got some place to, to anchor it, uh, maybe you want to live part-time in Panama, an Airbnb it. We call it a CBNB. <laughs> Those are the main ways right now. If you're a founder, there's a zillion ways. I'll talk your ear off about companies yeah. you could start. Yeah. So is there a waiting list for the C pods then? I, yes. Just because they're, they're the pr full production line is not going. You know, they're making the molds for the ferro cement and all of that. Okay. All right. If I order one today, how long before I'd get it? I think the first one's come up. I would guess first half of next year, but you'd want to check with them. Okay. All right. Uh, now, are, are you part uh, owner of that organization or? I, I'm not, but I'm involved in, uh, in purchasing one of the, one of the first ones. Okay. All right. So we're going to see how that works sometime in the near future. Yeah. Um, any last word for our guests on the podcast today? Yeah, I'd say, uh, if you're interested in the land side, also check out uh, Pronomos VC Twitter. And either way, my personal Twitter, Patricimo, P A T R I S S I M O, that's kind of the, the hub for my contributions. And I think the last thing I'll say is it's been, it's been such a delightful ride. But Thomas, I'm sure you've seen this across a bunch of fields from these ideas. I mean, we were talking on Yahoo Groups mailing lists 20 years ago. Yeah. And now I'm meeting with countries about deals to make flags and build new cities. So uh. it's incredible. It's incredible. And I want everyone to remember that, and that's, it's not just us, a whole bunch of different, different futurist sectors, that ideas that seem fringe and crazy today, if you pick the right ones, they can happen. And if they're big enough, if they take 10 or 20 or 30 years to happen, it doesn't matter if they're big enough to matter in that period of time. So don't think that just because you're on something fringe with a small group of people, if they're sharp people and it's a sharp idea, it can happen. I've seen it and I know it's going to, it's happened again and again, and it still will. So I don't know, listen to people like Thomas and learn <laughs> about what those are and get involved as a maker early on. <laughs> well, Patri, this is, uh, this is brilliant. I, uh, I'm definitely going to get involved myself uh, in a bigger way. And I wish you the best moving into the future here. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was wonderful to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for being on our show. Thank you. All right.